crossing dimensions of time and space. Technology beyond comprehension. They are watching. They are waiting. They are already here. What the hell is that? I had this intense fear come over me. Bucks County, Pennsylvania, just outside the urban crush of Philadelphia. I moved up here six years ago. I'm 52 years old, married 32 years, I have two children. I think Bucks County is beautiful. But for Denise Murder, it's not all peace and quiet. It was in April of 2008. It was in the middle of the night, somewhere around 1 o'clock in the morning. My dog, Alex, is a little Yorkie, and he goes to bed with us. He sat up on the bed, and he was really growling. It was unusual for him to growl. What's going on, baby? What's going on? He wouldn't lay down, he wouldn't quit, to the point where he was showing his teeth. So I finally decided that there's got to be something wrong. Okay, I'm just gonna check, okay? Stay there. I was kind of nervous about living there on a first floor apartment, and I used to live in a house three stories. I just kept looking everywhere, trying to figure out what is he hearing? You know, what is going on? I thought for sure we had an intruder. I figure since I'm up that I would search around the back to make sure there wasn't like an animal coming out of the woods or a deer out back. A bright light in the sky caught my eye. It looked like headlights of a car. I had to wait for it to move and shift to really get a good look at it. At first, I could just see a round shape. My parents worked with airplanes, so I knew it wasn't a plane and I knew it wasn't a helicopter. And it wasn't like an airplane moving across the sky. It would go from one point to another point and stop. I felt like the object was scanning the area, the way it was moving, looking for something. I had this terrible, terrible fear come over me. I didn't know what was going to happen. I was worried. What? Come on, hurry up, man. Come on. Why? I was just standing here and there was all these lights on. There was this huge thing in the sky. I don't... I don't see it. But it was huge in the light. I, I couldn't see it. What did you see? My heart. Hmm? It's massive. Oh, my God. What is that? I know. 
it was shaped like a pill. It had the round edges, and then there was this boomerang shape, almost like a fender of a car attached to this round part. There was no wings, there was no propellers, there was no sound, it was dead silence. It left no trail, no sound. It was gone in an instant. What was that? I knew it was nothing that I've ever seen in my life. You saw what it is? I, I saw that. That's crazy. Don't tell anybody about this, okay? Don't. Let's go back to bed. We'll talk about it in the morning. Don't. Talk about it in the morning. Okay? I'm not supposed to tell anyone. We're going to think you're crazy. Yeah, what am I supposed to do? Come on, come on, let's go back to bed. Dad, don't go to bed. It's probably still out there. Let's go back to bed. Dad, no. My husband, Dan, is afraid I'd be ridiculed. But I just felt so strongly about it. I just had this terrible urge that I had to say what I saw. The next morning, Denise contacts the editor of the local paper. I don't know what possessed me to call the newspaper because I'm not that type of person. I told him about my incident. He said, I want you to do me a favor and contact MUFON. The Mutual UFO Network is an international organization that investigates UFO sightings around the world. We get about one case per day in Pennsylvania to investigate. Of those cases, we probably can eliminate 80% as an identifiable flying object. I'm always skeptical because a lot of people want to believe and there's a difference between uh, having a good case with evidence and just wanting the case to be real. I got involved in this case with Bob Gardner, my chief investigator for Pennsylvania. What impressed me with Denise was that she was uh, ready to tell her story. I thought there was something here, so I ran out here to see. Bob came out the following day to talk to me. It was right there. It was huge. It was hovering overhead. Okay. She was a middle-aged woman, professional. She was very light genuine. She was exact to what she reported. Pool of light was mesmerizing. I, I felt like he thought I was telling the truth. It was almost like it was dancing on me. So scared. And they were just like right across the yes, earth. Look. First thing we do is we eliminate anything that could be man-made, anything that could be a natural phenomenon. I could see, I could, I could see a ton of it in there. I didn't see any lights or anything that could be construed as a UFO. Uh, and I had a general idea of how the moon was at that time of the day, so I knew it wasn't the moon. Did, uh, tell me more about the, the lights. Was it, was it more of a, kind of a, a wash across the whole area, or were there beams, or? All over my lawn, there was... What did Denise see hovering above her yard? You know, one of the things we had to uh, work through was, is this our craft? Is this a military craft? I just kept going through the aircrafts that I knew growing up, being down at the airport all the time with my father. Willow Grove Air Force Base is close by. And I did think, is it something that they were doing? Dr. Scott Miller tracks developments in classified aircraft technology known as Black Projects. There have just been tremendous technological advancements that have taken place in the, in the so-called black world. It's estimated the Air Force budget yearly for classified aircraft is in excess of $10 billion. The Department of Defense and various agencies have made no bones about it. They want to broaden the stealth bandwidth. They want to go completely from the acoustic range all the way through electromagnetic, through the visible regime, and, it, and if possible, the ultimate would be a, a vehicle that is invisible. You end up with aircraft that typically have a non-traditional form, and uh, that creates potentially a, a strange sighting for somebody. But the craft Denise saw was completely silent. Nothing could move like that without some kind of sound. There's absolutely no way to make anything perfectly silent. You would have to have something that is 100% efficient in order not to produce noise.
Within days of Denise's sighting, MUFON receives more calls from area residents. The reports are trickling in that people are seeing something in the skies. All of a sudden, we're getting 15 cases a day. You know, I, I am kind of skeptical, but there were so many reports. One of these reports has an eerie similarity to Denise's sighting. You have to believe something was flying over this area. In Bucks County, Pennsylvania, Denise Murter sees a strange craft hovering over her backyard. Don't tell anybody about this, okay? We'll, we'll talk about it in Going the against her husband's wishes, Denise contacts the Mutual UFO Network and discovers there is no explanation for what she saw. It was right there. It was huge, hovering overhead. I did think for a second, did that really happen? I thought for sure people were really going to think I'm bonkers. Then, just days after Denise's sighting, MUFON receives a call from another Bucks County resident. We had a, a good witness by the name of Cliff Taylor. Uh, he was sleeping. It was around 4 in the morning and his dog started barking and woke him up. sees a large object moving towards his house. It couldn't be an airplane because of how slow it was moving. When the lightning went off, he was able to see detail to it where it had all kinds of structure on, on the top of it and windows along the sides of it. I was really glad to hear about Cliff's story, just to prove there was something really going on. We're getting corroborating witnesses that are seeing the same object now within the uh, same area. With more and more sightings popping up, uh, I thought it would be a good idea to contact Philadelphia International Airport to see if anything is turned up on the radar tracks. And uh, we caught a break. They did find an object that matched the same date and time frame as Cliff Taylor's site. This object didn't have a transponder code to it. A uh, transponder code is something that's attached to all the aircraft in the area. Because there was no transponder code on it, there was nothing else to group it under other than an unidentified flying object. Did the craft come from beyond our Earth? My first reaction is to be a skeptic until I can see enough proof and go through the steps to uh, investigate the case. Two weeks later, the eyewitness evidence continues to mount. Alex, you know, growling in the middle of the night, showing his teeth, and I'm like, oh my God, it can't be, it's back again. I could see a lot of lights. I could actually see like tiny little windows on the craft. I just remember feeling desperate to have proof of what I saw. I usually keep my camera by the back door. I just was trying to do the best that I could at this point. Just keep aiming it up in the air and keep snapping and hope I got something. My camera was really acting crazy. I feel like the craft is knowing that I'm watching it. I felt like they were surveilling the area, like they were looking for something. It was beaming down lights in the trees at different areas around my yard. I was really starting to worry about my safety. Maybe it wants me. I, I couldn't move. I felt like I was 
was paralyzed. To be honest, I don't know how long I was out there. I did pray to God that this was going to be the last sighting because I don't think I could handle much more, you know? I contacted uh, Bob Gardner. I said, Bob, you're not going to believe this. I said, but it happened again. This is the exact... She had pictures of the object, and that, and that is rare. A lot of times people don't think to take a picture. They're more excited about seeing something and want to keep an eye on it. I don't really think I captured anything wonderful. Some of them were just like colorful lines. But one of the photos shows something more. Did you see that? I was just so amazed by this. What I saw was a row of lights like a boomerang. And you could tell that these lights or around a physical object. There's no way that there's a bunch of stars or the moon or anything was lined up like that. This just added more weight in our favor that, yeah, we're on to something that it could possibly be a UFO. It was really disturbing. Your brain goes a mile a minute when you see something and you don't know what it is. I really did have a hard time sleeping after that. Yep. It just felt like they're on some type of mission to get something, but I didn't know what. Why is it me? Why is it this backyard? And why does it keep coming back? When a strange ship visits her backyard for the second time, Denise Murter manages to capture an image on camera. Supported by other witnesses in the Bucks County area and photographic evidence, and with no other plausible explanation, MUFON investigators believe Denise caught sight of a UFO. There were certainly things going on here that didn't seem to be conventional or of, of our technology. For Denise, the bizarre experiences are far from over. This time it's even closer to my house. I could see it plain as day. It was hovering over a tree right outside my bedroom window. It couldn't get any closer or, I don't know, it'd be on top of the apartment building. I just couldn't get my eyes off of it. I had this intense fear. was in jeopardy. All this glitter came out of the craft and it went into two different trees. It was sparkling like Christmas lights. I actually closed my eyes and opened them back up. I'm like, oh my gosh, am I dreaming? And this 
quietness came over me and I, I don't know if it has communication with your subconscious. I just remember the words like it was yesterday. Don't worry, I'm not here to hurt you. As fast as it came, it just disappeared. I did really feel in my heart that that was a UFO. I feel like now that this has happened, I have to believe in aliens, like unless these ships are driving themselves. Is life beyond Earth possible? Dr. Daniel Bacheldor is involved in the search for planets capable of supporting life beyond our solar system. The only place we have found life in the universe, of course, is on the Earth, which is a planet. So if we're looking for the evidence of life outside of the Earth, we think that we have to have a planet. The number of planets that we are finding outside of our solar system is increasing daily. That is increasing the chances of there being uh, life elsewhere in the universe. But could an alien spacecraft travel the vast distance from a faraway planet to Denise's backyard? To actually send an object uh, out there is, is a question of propulsion, essentially. We know what is needed for interstellar travel. There are, there are a few tweaks that we need to make here and there to our current technology, but we ourselves, within the next hundred years or so, could actually be capable of visiting other planets. So the thought that there are other beings out there that may be more highly evolved than us or have better technology visiting our Earth, it's not something that you can immediately discount. The next day was rough. I really thought, who in the hell is going to believe this story? On July 8th, Denise called me saying, Bob, the object came back and this time it was there for about 40 minutes and it released a debris field that came down that was all sparkly. I uh, looked around to see if I heard or saw any other instances in the case where metallic objects came down and I wasn't able to find anything. So my privet tree just lit up and it was, it was like this silver shower of flakes. It was unbelievable. Kind of an I'm color. thinking, hey, did this actually happen or is she adding to the story uh, just to make it a little more dramatic? It was unbelievable. Let me take a closer look at that. Hmm. There's nothing that I could see physically that happened to the trees. By looking at it, you couldn't tell that this was affected at all. You know, it's funny, Denise, I don't really see any marks here. There's no evidence of any, any kind. At this point, I'm a little upset now. Is Denise making this up? All right. I was skeptical. I'll be honest with you. I didn't believe her that these metallic sprinkles were, were dropped into her tree. Denise faces an even stronger reaction when the area sightings garner more media attention. People were mocking me. People were going into my husband's job. They were going in with tinfoil on their head and saying they're from Mars. And my children were embarrassed, they told me, of me. You know, that hurt, you know. I swore I was never going to talk about it again. Is it really worth all this to do this for nothing except to torture my family and myself? But her most recent experience prompts a surprising response. I received this email from this person in Florida stating that he had something that happened to him that scared them to death. When a strange craft visits her backyard for the third time, Denise Murter's unusual experiences move from surreal to the utterly bizarre. 
Press coverage prompts ridicule from the community, and Denise tries to bury the incidents until she receives an email describing an unexplained event over a decade and a half earlier. My name is Jared Lee. I'm a graduate student at the University of Florida. I'm an aerospace engineer. I was 13 years old, living in Havana, Florida. My mother and father both worked for the state of Florida. The area there was sparsely populated. We went to town, went to Tallahassee to pick up a pizza. We got home probably around 10. seen this? What's that, son? What's happening, Jen? There appeared to be lights coming down from the top of the trees. They looked like they were scanning the forest floor looking for something. We assumed that this was hunters shining for deer. Somebody said, how did they get the lights to the top of the trees? because these are 60, 70 foot tall trees and you can't get a deer stand up that high. You can't climb that high. My dad got a really worried look on his face. What's going on? I don't, I don't know what that could be. Honey. It was the first time in my life that I actually seen him afraid. Let's go back to the house, come on. Come on. All of a sudden, from the left side, this large red ball of light, at least five feet in diameter. And then from the right, you had another bluish green colored ball of light glide up to where these lights were coming from. Both of the balls of light disappeared, and it was complete darkness for maybe a second or two. Jared, baby, we gotta go inside. And then this gigantic beam of light, a glistening golden white colored light shines straight to the floor of the forest the entire forest lit up you could see the particles glistening all through the forest i don't know what's going on at the very top of the light you could make out the entire craft the size of the thing was unbelievable what the hell is that so the phenomenon was ongoing for probably between 10 and 15 minutes total. Oh my God! Never heard a sound, never seen it move. It clicked off and it was gone. Are you okay? Are you okay? What the hell was that? It was the most amazing thing that I'd ever experienced in my life. What made me want to contact Denise was how she described the light. I've never heard another account anywhere where the person had seen the light in that kind of detail and described it that way as being glitter-like. I was thrilled to find out that something did come back to uh, corroborate my story the way I described it, he, he thought it was to the T of what he experienced. Did Denise and Jared witness some kind of natural electrical phenomena? Dr. Joseph Dwyer, professor of physics and space sciences, specializes in lightning research. Ball lightning has been reported for hundreds of years. People will describe a maybe a ball the size of a softball that um, it will move horizontally it will last several seconds maybe as bright as a 60 watt light bulb it's not necessarily just a white light it has colors other people have reported sparks coming out from it there are a lot of theories of ball lighting it could be some kind of a chemical reaction you know something burning that is floating along it could be uh, electrical it could be some kind of a plasma a heated ball of gas 
Does ball lightning explain the bright lights Jared and his parents saw? Ball lightning's been described to do a lot of very bizarre things, to enter people's houses, to go through windows. A lot of stories have it moving horizontally, but it, I suppose, could also move up and down. There was no way to mistake something like that for something that my family and I witnessed uh, the years earlier. Ball lightning doesn't account for the hovering craft and glittering particles both Jared and Denise clearly report seeing. So were the lights caused by a rare weather phenomenon? St. Elmo's fire is an electrical discharge, is a coronal discharge in electrified atmosphere. If there's thunderstorms, if there's electrical activity in the atmosphere, you can have ships or aircraft, anything that can produce electric fields require an electrical charge. But what you would see is sort of a diffuse, uh, kind of maybe purplish, bluish glow. It's not hot, but it can emit light somewhat like a flame, so it's called St. Elmo's Fire. Did Jared simply see the effects of St. Elmo's Fire on an aircraft passing through a thunderstorm? I had been sent on assignment to Uzbekistan. I noticed uh, in the evening out on the tarmac uh, a strange light off in the distance. It was essentially a type of a St. Elmo's fire. I can understand how someone who's never experienced this could misidentify the St. Elmo's fire for something otherworldly, but it doesn't resemble what we've seen in the least. That is not what we saw. It's not even close. It's a joke. Learning about Jared's incident, MUFON investigators revisit Denise's case. We have an outside witness that didn't know Denise, now contacting her, saying that he saw the same thing. This added a lot more credibility to the case that this wasn't a one-time type phenomenon. And it opens up an exciting possibility. A close encounter of the second kind is a situation where this evidence left behind where you not only see the craft but it leaves some sort of residue or evidence behind finding physical evidence would elevate this case to a whole new level those encounters are rare look at this in 2008 Denise Murter witnesses a strange craft showering the trees in her backyard with glittering light particles before vanishing into thin air. 17 years earlier, Jared Lee experiences a similar event. I don't know how anybody could come up with a story like this if, you know, you're a sane person. You know what I mean? You just, it's just something that you never hear of. In light of Jared's recent report, MUFON investigator Bob Gardner turns his attention to the trees in Denise's backyard. Look at this. In July, these leaves are showing signs of severe aging. Signs of aging that they should be showing in October. It's something rapidly caused these leaves to age. So that's why I figured, let me collect the evidence and I'll send it out to the lab. I made this almost like a crime scene. I made sure I put rubber gloves on to collect the samples. I took uh, samples from the privet tree that was affected and the soil, and the maple tree and the soil. Then he went down the street from me and found a similar tree to my tree in the backyard, and he took uh, samples from that tree. A control sample lets the labs know what the baseline reading should be for that area. I immediately bagged everything up to keep it from being contaminated. The way Denise described the sparkles were that they were just hovering there, floating around in the air. I kind of thought that these could have been some kind of sensors or some kind of a experiment going on. Maybe this is some sort of a probe that's being dropped into the trees to take samples and then was being pulled back up into the ship for whatever purpose that they had. I was hoping that by sending these out to the lab to be tested that we would get some answers. A thousand miles away in Florida, Jared Lee works to identify the craft he saw 17 years earlier. I honestly believed that it was something that our 
military had, that they had maybe gotten off course. Havana is situated in the panhandle of uh, northern Florida, and we have many large military bases that specifically deal with aircraft. It wasn't uncommon to see military aircraft in the area. So I spent a lot of my time in the library. Every book I could read on uh, aircraft, space vehicles, rockets, experimental aircraft. For a solid object that size to hover in place, I don't know of a technology we have that's capable of doing that. We have a blimp base in Florida, in Pompano Beach. Is it possible that what we could have seen could have been a blimp? Type of airships that potentially have been sighted and related to unidentified flying objects are probably more a mixture of those airplane, traditional blimp, hybrid combination. It would either have a deltoid uh, lifting body shape or uh, literally a wing kind of shape. An airship of the type I'm talking about could uh, easily be perceived as not moving at all or moving extremely slowly. And then also because of the propulsion systems you would need, could also have a very high speed dash capability. But this advanced airship technology is only very recently established. I realized the blimp couldn't have possibly been responsible for, for what we've seen. Through his studies at the University of Florida, Jared explores other possible explanations. We had a uh, professor here that was doing research on something called WEAVE, which is a wingless electromagnetic air vehicle. And uh, this was a state-of-the-art type of propulsion that would revolutionize the aerospace industry. So I sought him out asked if I could uh, be part of his team. I had the feeling that there could be a relation or a link between what he was doing and the vehicle we seen in the early 90s. After working for Dr. Roy, I realized that was uh, er erroneous. We're not capable of producing anything like I witnessed that night. The vehicle we witnessed that night was something not made oh by us as in human beings on this planet. It came from something somewhere else. Denise was the only person I knew that had seen something similar to what I witnessed. I felt very connected to him. He was so happy to have someone to talk to that went through the same exact thing. And now he knows he's not crazy, you know? And I feel the same exact way. It, it renewed my interest in, uh, you know, trying to, trying to uh, find an answer. Learning that uh, MUFON was uh, investigating that case and that they had uh, took some samples from the tree there made me want to go back and relook at the area that we had witnessed the sin all those years earlier. The uh, trees had never grown similar to the trees in the other area. There's almost a, uh, a, a perfect ring of uh, trees that appear discolored from the air and appear completely different, unhealthy color from the rest of the uh, trees in that area. Were the glittering particles that Jared saw also responsible for the damaged leaves MUFON investigators recovered from Denise's backyard? Can science provide the answer? There was something extraordinary happened in my tree. In Bucks County, Pennsylvania, during the summer of 2008, a mysterious craft releases an astonishing shower of glittering particles across Denise Murder's backyard. There was something extraordinary happened in my tree. Looking for trace evidence, MUFON investigators send samples of the affected leaves to the lab. Physical evidence plays an important role in any case that we have. The more evidence we can gather, the better judgment we can make on the case. I was curious about what they found when they analyzed those uh, tree samples. 
Is there some sort of chemicals, some sort of residue that's left on the leaves? Phyllis Budinger, an analytical chemist, specializes in identifying unknown molecular substances. My major emphasis is on infrared spectroscopy. You look at the substance with infrared light and the molecular vibrations interact with the infrared light at various frequencies. The resulting spectrum is unique for each individual molecule. It's just like DNA is unique to each individual. What I was looking for was anything unusual on the leaves and in the soil that should not be there. I could not detect anything. When nothing shows up on the molecular level, Phyllis takes a different tact. I sent the samples to a lab for elemental analysis, which has the acronym ICP, which means inductively coupled plasma. It's a, a, a really good technique for identifying uh, elements. There is elevated boron on the privet leaves and not on the control leaves. Boron is an element. It's number five on the periodic table. There was no elevated levels of boron in the soil, so there was no explanation as to where this boron came from. The tree that uh, wasn't hit did not have anything like that on the leaves. My tree was definitely radiated with something from this craft. Boron is something that's commonly used in a lot of aerospace uh, applications. It's also used in fertilizers and things like that, so it wouldn't be out of place, but in that amount uh, on that tree, uh, highly unusual. Samples also show elevated levels of magnesium. I came across something called Fawcett's Repetitions. It listed similar chemicals that are found in UFO investigations, and what do you think shows up? boron and magnesium. Take a closer look at that. You don't find the boron and magnesium generally in your trees and in the backyard, but it's a common chemical found when somebody describes a close encounter of the second kind where, where something touches soil, leaves from, from a craft. I felt the testing proved that there was something that happened without a doubt. There's boron and magnesium in my tree, and it just doesn't get there by itself. Send their samples off to the lab, cemented that case to me, and saying, yes, this case involved alien contact. And yes, what Denise did see was an alien craft. Our understanding of science is only good until the next breakthrough happens. We may find out life is uh, more abundant than we could have ever imagined. It's making me wonder now, since this has happened, like anything's possible. And, you know, all those people that say things that happen now, like, you know, now I'm not going to like shun them or I'm really going to listen to them. Everything has changed. Thank you.